Mm. All right, we are on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are on. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, we apologize for the slight delay in uh, starting, but uh, mm -hmm. of course, the show must go on. Now, we have to begin by going right into it, and we need to uh, introduce some of the panelists we have. We have a very brilliant team that we are, are going to take us through the next one or two hours. Uh, on my extreme left, uh, we have with us uh, one of the most brilliant narrators I've ever met, Mr. John Kennedy, a renowned film actor and stage director, famous for his leading role in the movies Grey Matter and uh, 100 Days, currently on a tour of Rwanda to promote Tivets. That is uh, you here. And then we have Miss Angel Visamaza, the new production product development manager at Tigo. Nice to have you as well. We have Caroline Turk, World Bank Rwanda. Nice to have you here as well. We have Mr. Patrick Kabajama, the chairman of the ICT chamber. And uh, we have uh, Joseph Marion. Mm -hmm. I got that right. Joseph Marion, uh, the UNFPA representative, to tell us more about the Show Your Selfie campaign. In a world where uh, selfies get more likes on Instagram mm -hmm. than a petition to save forests, <laughs> I think this is the most brilliant team to have here today. So we'll just go straight into it. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the agenda of the uh, Social Good Summit, Social Good Summit is a uh, a two-day conference that is held globally. In Rwanda, it is held once, uh, that aims to tell people how inno innovation and uh, media and uh, social media, I mean, and technological initiatives can help progress, can help ensure progress uh, in Rwanda and in the world. So we want to answer the question, in, by 2030, where do we aim to be? Not uh, using policies, government policies, or all of that, but linked to technology. So those are the questions that we are going to answer today. So we encourage the guests who are here to ask as many questions as possible, and we encourage the panelists to be as open-minded as possible to some of the questions that you'll receive. Some might be really hard, and you might uh, need to engage amongst yourselves, but we'll try and uh, take this mm -hmm. as smoothly as possible. So uh, now the, the theme around uh, this time is uh, the 2030 now, connecting for good, connecting for all. So what the panelists will be required to do, let me just stand so that I have all of you. Mm -hmm. what, uh, the, what the panelists will be required to do and anyone who wants to attend and get questions to some of the, uh, answers to some of the questions that you might have, connecting for good, connecting for all. If you have any questions regarding how each of these platforms, each of the people here can tell you how uh, they intend to make sure that Rwanda has progress. You can ask your questions at any time during the question session. So I think we'll just start uh, with the panelists here. Uh, the theme of this year's 20, 2014, uh, the, the summit is connecting for good, connecting for all. Now you've been widely, uh, you're w versed with uh, what has happened before, even before technological innovations were here, and now that technology has come. How do you think technology is uh, pushing Rwanda and in to the Rwanda that we want to see? Yeah, thank you very much, George. Um, indeed, it is good and for all. If I would go back to our years, our time, as you see, I'm, ki I'm, I'm kind of elder, um, somewhere in 50s. But before 50s, it was really kind of tough. I mean the life. To me, first of all, I would term technology as an easier life system that eases life to a certain point, to a certain grade. Now, and it is meant to be for all. If I come back to Rwanda, uh, sincerely speaking, it was long, long, long in the dark, where there was no technology, whereby everyone had to think hard, whereby everyone had to struggle hard just to get a piece, uh, I would call it a piece of something that you need for your life. But now, as we kept on growing up, growing up, growing up, things started changing. Technology is coming up. Uh, we started having a difference into our lives. We started having differences in uh, watching television. We had no television. Uh, that is 
This of the technology I'm talking about, the simplest televisions came, we started having the communications came. Uh, life became a little bit easier. At the first ground, if I would start it, I would start it from that level. From where I was to where I am, there's quite a very, very, very big difference because of technology. Because it has kind of eased my life somewhere, somehow. Yeah, I think, George, as we keep on going, maybe I will still tell you more. If given the time. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely love to hear from you because we can see that the generations are, are really represented and the gender is really represented. We spoke mm -hmm. about not having women first, but now we have to come to you, Miss Angel. Now, you are in charge of uh, the production development at uh, Tigo. How, how have you seen, of course, you can see uh, new innovations coming up and you have people presenting to you ideas each and every day about what can be implemented from Tigo. But uh, how is the relevance to the, the current development right now? What is the relevance of products to development? Yeah, thank you. Uh, what I would say is uh, technology for good, technology for all. Uh, it's more of having now innovation for people. That's the new trend right now. It's not about actually the real technology, but it's more of the technology that serves the people. So uh, today we might have a various level of technology and how it has been evolving all uh, around the world. But uh, when I look here, what is relevant to this market and what is accessible to this market is not necessarily what is accessible and relevant in another market. So what I would say it's more of we have technology. Some of it can be relevant to this time for us and some of uh, others will be relevant in the few years coming up. So. Um, when I look today, uh, we receive a various type of apps uh, that the youth is developing, uh, even ourselves. But every time we think about a product or we think about uh, how to make technology available, we think first about the people. How is that, as you said, how is that going to uh, to allow people around us to to have services and different type of uh, activity in the most efficient way. So I think at uh, the bottom line of technology is meant to serve people. And in the coming years, we will see how much is that serving us in our environment and in based on our needs. And uh, we will just follow uh, along the way. So that's how I can put it. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one one for the men and the women. <laughs> now, uh, we have Thank to come you. to you, Caroline, and uh, World Bank of Rwanda. When we hear that, we definitely think of money and how financial institutions impact on uh, development in ICT. Now, we've had very many conferences and exhibitions. As Rwanda uh, gets hold of conference tourism, there has been the African Development Bank, uh, the meetings, there was the Transform Africa last year, just recently there was the World Expo Development Forum, and all of them, as much as they discuss on their own issues, they always touch on ICT. And that means that every institution has its role of, uh, as an ICT inside it. And definitely World Bank uh, is one of the people who are supporting them financially. So as we discussed with very many participants in the ICT sector, people developing apps and young SMEs, they always talk about financial constraints. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. people always talk about it. The policies, policy makers, they always talk about it in the forums. But after that, that's it. Like, people have a press release, but the money does no, is not released. <laughs> so so <laughs> how does the World Bank come in to at least make sure that it's not only talk, but implementation in its actuality? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's, a, that's a very important question. We, you know, the World Bank has supported uh, the government of Rwanda in terms of investments in, in the... Uh, infrastructure around ICT. We helped to bring the fiber optic cable here uh, by putting a big investment through a regional project that we have. Um, but we're also working through our projects in other sectors. So we invest, as the World Bank, we invest a lot of money, for example, in the agriculture sector. And part of what we're doing there, uh, and, and as you know, the Ministry of Agriculture has an important kind of aspect to their work, which is about outreach to farmers, about making farmers connected, about connecting farmers to markets, not just physically, not just with the feeder road, but also it markets in terms of knowledge of prices and things. I, I, and I've been up to, you know, very sort of 
isolated corners of, of Rwanda and found quite a lot of farmers with cell phones who are getting prices, who are making sure that they're not being ripped off by traders because they know <laughs> what the price of different products are. Um, so uh, that our approach at the moment is to work through the kind of programs where we have substantial investments in, in agriculture, in energy, in, which is upcoming, urban development, in our kind of governance work with government to try and infuse a kind of um, the uptake of technology that, and uh, an outreach of technology through those kind of sector. It's a kind of approach to mainstreaming across government rather than kind of treating it as an isolated uh, issue, if you like. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now we have to come to you, uh, and we're, we're, when we look at you, we are seeing a representative of the Rwandan government, so to speak, uh, in your role as uh, chairman of the ICT chamber. So uh, we'd like to ask you, how has ICT helped in implementation of the day-to-day -day, uh, hurdles and milestones that are uh, being put out by the government and by my ICT? How has ICT helped that? Yeah, I just need to correct for some uh, private sector. I'm the chairman of the chamber, but we work very closely with the government. So uh, I'd like first to help on the World Bank. I, there is one fact. Rwanda, the cost of internet was reduced sevenfold because of a grant of the World Bank. And that's happened uh, the last three years. And I think uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs do not see the structural because the World Bank is really helping the government of Rwanda together to address structural change that affect the whole industry. Today, the price of internet have drastically reduced the access also because of, uh, of the partnership with the World Bank. Now, as far as um, we are concerned in, in, in the private sector, there's a lot of issues uh, that we are facing. But one of the most important and we are trying uh, to address is how to continue to reduce the cost of access of internet. For example, I give a simple example. In the US or UK, you can get five, 10, 10 meg link for what? $35 or, or more. I mean, these are country of GDP per capita of uh, 40, 50,000 dollars. Here we have seven, 800, uh, 700 uh, per capita. We pay um, about a thousand dollars. So, the least wealthy country pay an arm and a leg. And if we trying to do a parity, I mean, it's really hundred, couple hundred times more expensive to 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 connect the people in Rwanda. So now it's tr the government of Rwanda have done substantially uh, work with both uh, the development partner, some uh, the Korea Telecom to do project, the fiber, now the 4G. But now the next challenge is to bring the price to the level where a farmer can afford this connection. And I think that is the biggest challenge because all the application, all the benefit that we've seen in developing country as far as internet penetration will, will not be able to repeat if we do not get the cost and the access of internet affordable to the common person, not just for an elite. Now, just number, right now, Africa, we have about 16% uh, internet penetration rate. We have 1.1 billion. So by 2025, if we look, let's say a 50% uh, uh, penetration rate, it's a substantial business opportunity for the private sector. I mean, it's 300, 600 million customers. I mean, this is, there's no such growth in any other place on the planet. So for the businesses, it's good opportunity, but a lot of work and partnership need to be done be between the, part, the private sector, the government, and uh, non-government, uh, non-NGOs and uh, international organization to really get the price point where the people of Africa can afford the connection. Thank you, thank you very much. Now we are about to come to you, Joseph, but to all the people who are watching uh, here and uh, online, you can talk to us through the Twitter, which is UNDP underscore Rwanda, the mm -hmm. 2030 now. And uh, now as we go to Joseph, for all of you who have any questions regarding anything that they're saying now, whether it's the media or personal questions that you want answered, 
however simple or however hard, will come to you immediately after Joseph. So just make sure you have your questions ready. We won't move from that point until you ask your questions. We'll come to each and every one of you individually to ask what you have uh, for us, for what you want to know from the Social Good Summit. Now, Joseph, you're uh, responsible for the Show Yourself Show Yourself campaign. I'll, I'll let you touch on that a bit later, but for now, uh, the UN Population Fund has been able to implement strategies in different economies, in different countries. Now, of course, you've seen countries that are more developed than Rwanda and countries that are less developed than Rwanda. So I wanted to ask you, what is Rwanda doing? What, uh, what is the difference between what Rwanda is doing now and what Rwanda should be doing to ensure that we bridge the gap between reaching that level of uh, that level? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, I would like to also pitch the discussion a little bit differently because it's a lot about business here, about <laughs> 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 uh, money, about <laughs> uh, banking. <laughs> and I think uh, I would like to pitch it back towards people um, mm -hmm. in, in a way. Huh? Because um, uh, technology, and it's not only internet, of course internet is a, is a very big thing, but it's also uh, living together in urban environments is also a form of technology in a way, uh, is changing a lot the, uh, the society in Rwanda and the thinking and the values. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the question that I would like them to put on the table is uh, how can we make sure that uh, Rwanda takes advantage of all these different uh, 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 ideas that come up there's a lot of young people, and we go back to the young people again, who, mm -hmm. who have a quite different uh, view of their uh, life and their perspectives in life than their parents had. Um, I must say, yeah, Rwanda is still like uh, now a, 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 a uh, mainly agricultural society, but also the World Bank, they have done studies on urbanization and uh, perspectives for the future of Rwanda. And uh, the... Uh, that kind of technology of living in urban environments together with all the communication, all the uh, internet and all, and television. Television, because even in the countryside, lots of places don't have yet television at this time. Uh, so there's a lot of changes to come still in Rwanda with regard to what people think really, what the values are about many important aspects of life. Uh, and aspects of life that concern us with regard to health, for instance, education, uh, sexuality, what is uh, a part of UNFPA's work. Th these, these ideas are very much influenced by uh, the modern uh, technology of urban living and of uh, internet and television and telecom in general. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that, Joseph. Uh, now, is there anyone in the crowd, in the audience, that would like to ask a, a question, maybe directly to any one of the panelists, to discuss one or two things that you might want cleared up? Is there anyone from the, from the crowd? Um, I, uh, my name is Kristen Haas, and I currently work at Marinundo Girls' School in Namata. And um, I noticed that you talked about the fiber optic cable. And that's actually just across the street from our school. We can see the little <laughs> stone there, and it says fiber optic on it. But our school has no internet right now. We use Tigo. We get one gigabyte a day for the whole school, and only the teachers use it. It only lasts a few hours. So... How are you ensuring that people actually have access to fiber optic? How is, it's good that it's in the country, but if people are not able to access it, if it's too expensive to have the technology, then what is the purpose of having in the first place? That question, of course, will be posed to Tigo directly and to the chairman <laughs> of the ICT <laughs> chamber. <laughs> <laughs> so over to you. Okay, uh, with regard to that, I wouldn't say 
that I won't put the infrastructure yet because waiting for people to attain a certain level to afford the technology. I would say that it's there, uh, as Patrick was saying, there are mechanisms and other ways that the government uh, in partnership with the private mm -hmm. sector, they need to do, and that affects the economy. You just you just can't wake up one day and say, because it's next door, I can just connect it. So there is a lot of dynamics around that need to evolve as as we as we develop the market to access that uh, that technology. So for me, I wouldn't say that it's not it's nothing to have it, but it's a basis. It's just like you're building a house. You need to start with the foundation. The rest you will get the mean as the economy evolves and as new policies are coming along the way. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. will be my contribution generally, not generally. To uh, could you hear from you, Patrick, as well? Yes, uh, I think there's a confusion here, and uh, let. Uh, let me try to uh, to explain a bit. Now, the fiber optic is like a highway system. Enable um, big capacity to be routed to uh, most of the country. So now, the second phase really after the fiber optic is really to build uh, an access uh, network which means you see the project that the government has signed with uh, Korea Telecom, which within the next three years will cover 95% of the populated area of Rwanda. So they're going to leverage the existing fiber optic uh, network, and now it will be easy for you to have access. Now, the problem is, for example, you can be just even 500 meters from the fiber optic. To extend the fiber optic 500 meter, it's extremely costly. So that's why um, it is very difficult uh, to do it on the case by case uh, uh, basis. And that's why the, uh, there is uh, the, this 4G uh, network project. And uh, Rwanda would pretty much solve its access and uh, distribution uh, uh, issue. But in the meantime, I will offer that uh, you give us uh, your you give us our, your contact. There's other technologies that can be used to connect. And if you're that close to a fiber optic manhole, maybe there's something in the meantime that can be done. So I'll make sure we get, I uh, get your contact after the meeting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll invoice you for that because I gave you <laughs> direct so solutions mm -hmm. for your problem. And now is there anyone else who has uh, a question that they'd like to pose to the panelists? Anyone at all? Okay, my name is Kibo. Uh, I'm working on a web startup. So uh, my question is goes to uh, partnership between uh, Rwanda and uh, I, uh, Rwanda government and World Bank for development of internet. So uh, as Patrick mentioned that the cost of internet is so painful uh, for for Rwanda when you compare to GDP with uh, here in a developing country. So I would like to know uh, at which point uh, the partnership of Rwanda and World Bank will help to reach the point that the cost of internet will be more affordable for Rwandans. Thank you. <laughs> Who'd like to go first? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, let me respond to that. Um, the, the way the World Bank works is we work with the government. We work directly with the government and, and we, have, we have a significant uh, amount of resources that we can used to support the government over the next three years, um, but we give it to the government. Uh, we, we can't give it to individual businessmen <laughs> who, are, who are starting up, uh, mm -hmm. however fascinating and how, uh, however wonderful the apps are and mm -hmm. the websites that are being designed. We don't have a facility to, l to lend or give money directly to business, businessmen. What we can do in some countries, and we've done this in other countries, is we can lend to the, to the banking sector and work with the banking sector so that it's easier for small businesses and for startups to get access to the kind of um, investment capital that they need to, to get their ideas off the ground. Um, now, that's not something we're doing directly here, but, uh, but our, um, our sister organization, the IFC, is, is, is looking at the financial sector and looking at how they can interact with the financial sector best to try and, uh, to try and ease some of these constraints that, that, 
the, the small and new startups seem to face in, in, in getting, getting loans to, to, to sort of invest in, in the first few steps. Um, I mean, I think it's quite a common, common problem. When, when we discuss with the private sector what are their problems, we hear quite often that it's difficult, the financial sector doesn't want to take a chance, it's seen as too risky, um, and the cost of credit is quite high. So this is a, we would work through the financial sector rather than through the government on that. I mean, normally, normally our investments are in the form of, for example, this big fiber optic cable that comes along from the ocean and, and stretches through the, through the uh, country. And we give, it, we give them resources to the government for them to invest in that project. It's then up to the government to bring in the private sector to help uh, generate a lively and dynamic and vibrant uh, ICT sector around that kind of key bit of, of the infrastructure. Is your question answered? Cheers. I'm really itching to come to, to, come to you, John, because I have, I have some questions I want to ask you. But uh, is there anyone that we've left out from the, we have someone from the back? Uh, please also make sure you tell us who exactly you want your question to be directed to. I'm called Yulukundo Sevasore. I have an initiative called the Bright Future Cornerstone. Um, my question goes to the representative of TIGO and PSF, ICT Center. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for organizing such uh, conference or summit. Uh, the technology can really work for the, the social good. And I would like first to give an example I started the, uh, the initiative I have through internet, Facebook, and uh, I came to connect uh, almost uh, 800 people and engage to, to do good for the society. And I would like to say that what you are doing is good and technology is really changing lives of people and engaging young people and people to do good for the community. Now back to the, co the question I want to ask. Uh, you know, the government of Rwanda is having a program especially for young people. Uh, each, each, each year, in the end of the year, there is a program called Itorero. And there, they are teaching civic things, uh, civic modules. But I would like to know what is the, the, the program that like Tigo and ICT Chamber has for these young people, you know, Rwanda is having 75% of the population is young people. And then the educated one on the grassroots are in the secondary school. And they are gathered uh, each year in those itorero. Now, what is the program you are having for these young people who are finishing secondary schools? And what are the plan do you have to create jobs through uh, um, innovation uh, yeah, that's my question. Maybe one for the innovation for Tigo. Are you planning, for example, to bring in those centers the connectivity so they can learn how to use social media? I don't know. And <laughs> for you, uh, for the ICT, how do you think we can create jobs using those young people? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a very relevant one. Uh, TIGO has done uh, a good number of initiatives that aims at uh, promoting the youth as well as creating jobs. Not necessarily by owning, uh, directly funding the, the youth or being directly involved, but we have two main programs that I'm sure you're aware of. We have Reach for Change, which is uh, in now the direction is all digitalized. So everything that you have as initiative and can help boost the digitalization of the youth and the young people uh, in general, uh, we, we offer a fund. It's, through a, it's a very competitive platform where we want to provide to, um, to the country quality of initiatives. So uh, apart from that, that is more on our CSR work, but we have also an incubation center that started this year called Think. So we really want the youth to think and to bring innovative product where we challenge them to even think on how to make, to build their own uh, startups and be able to, um, to 
to, to develop it, to end up having uh, a company, a sustainable innovation. Because what we face on the market, most of the time, it's, there is a lot of ideas, very good ideas, but that just end to either the prototype level or just disappear or through a competition it just happened the person wins but we don't really see what happens after so tigo initiative is more of providing the needed funds we were talking about getting access to to funds we provide funds to uh to the startups to the initiative and we allow the person to even study the market and everything that is required in terms of acceleration of the pro uh, of the project so um to to just say in Itororo, you mentioned a lot of that. It's more of saying we create job by empowering the other youth. So it's not about only Tigo creating jobs. It's about Tigo enabling the the society to create more job for others. So that's what I would say as comment mm -hmm. for your questions. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome to apply even <laughs> <laughs> next time. Is there an unanswered question? Is there is something missing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Special for Tigo. Yes. <laughs> um, you see, for example, uh, my ICT can organize the ICT awareness. Yes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Then uh, that is in a general way of reaching the community. Mm -hmm. But those guys who are finishing secondary school, they are educated, they are skilled. Mm -hmm. Imagine Tigo being there with, for example, a mobile, mobile lab of ICT, and then you train or you avail those, um, that lab to train those young people in that, the, the Itorero. So you will be able at least to train 30,000 a year. So can you see that? So I was just asking if there is a kind of program. If not, may I just create awareness and think of that? Thank you. So, uh, as I mentioned in my answer, we are, it's not, we are enabling people are doing things like that. So basically, if you have an initiative, we have a platform where you can come and then show us how relevant that is, how much that can have an impact. And then it's our responsibility now to say, this is doable, this is not doable, and we can enable you to do that. So uh, you're very, we are very open to see, look into uh, uh, different initiative as long as it aligns with the platform that we have enabled in Rwanda specifically. I think you're going mm -hmm. to get a lot of emails <laughs> from yeah. people interested in giving you I think you, you should uh, post your <laughs> email, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. and now uh, I have a question from you, but allow me just to, to engage a few questions and then I'll come to you, mm -hmm. uh, back to you. But I really want to hear from Joseph and uh, my good friend here, uh, I saw you, the, the first time I ever saw you actually working, as we go now to our s the second part of our discussions, uh, I saw you at the stadium when there was Kwibuka, the commemoration of the 20 years. And uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't really meet you, you were not dressed in a suit that day, you were narrating the whole experience, and I could see exactly. you on the screen uh, as you narrated the whole period from 20 years ago to how Rwanda came to where we are now. And uh, now, I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure you've told this story year after year after year, you've perfected the art. How was it, um, how has it been, or how easy has it been now with the current uh, technology that has come up, or the current innovations, uh, to be able to uh, go from addressing people face to face to addressing an entire stadium projected on a very huge screen for people to get the message directly, whether, from, uh, whether you can see the presenter or not, how has this affected some of the, s what you do in your day-to-day -day job? How has technology affected that? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is what I would call <coughs> technology for good because in me personally, I understand there is even technology for bad because <laughs> man, man turned to be evil, to become evil and then use the technology in, a, in some other ways. But as you have asked, what has it affected in what, uh, generally what I was doing that very day? Now, it would have been very difficult for me to tell that story on a round fire. It would be first very difficult for me to project that voice, my voice, 
to over 10,000 people seated from 200 meters away from me. At this age, I couldn't project that. So the microphones was there and the speakers were there. And I understand there must have been so many people who, who were even short-sighted and others who are long-sighted, but some devices were used for at least for the narration, for the whole commemoration event to get to reach to everybody who was around there. Not only that, it even went beyond the stadium, beyond the borders of Rwanda, beyond the borders of Africa to the entire world. Everybody was watching. That's technology for good because if it hadn't been there during that time, there would have been very, very difficult uh, difficulty for the whole nation, for the whole world to understand exactly the grief of a Rwandan. It would, it would have been very, very difficult. It would have taken ages to come, to travel, to do what, to tell that story. But in just a blink of an eye, everything was just being formed up then. So technology to that extent was really good for me. And uh, my brother there was talking about creating jobs. Yes. Uh, or maybe if we come to another phase, uh, there is somewhere I, 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 I sometimes disagree that if there is no technology, or maybe the life would be very difficult for some people. Yes, indeed, it would. But remember, it would be very difficult for some people in third world countries, whereby technology, the disadvantage is it takes long. Takes long. And my stomach doesn't take all that long. <laughs> to, some people's, uh, to some people's minds, you would think it that way. Because if you look at Japan, now at the moment, Japan took long... Uh, to invent certain things. America took long to invent certain things. And up to now, there are certain things that me, a Rwandan, hasn't got yet. But a grown-up, a 50-year-old in Japan, got it when he was even 10 years old. But me here, I haven't seen it yet. But what had been invented years back. You understand? So when it comes to creating jobs, you need quick thinking. You really need quick thinking. You really need to know what to put there first because technology is a system that comes in. It was even there before, before even uh, people started inventing things. I think God was the first, uh, was first person to, to technology because he gave us the mind and the mind started uh, creating, I mean, inventing other things. Okay. So I appreciate so much because the Rwandan government itself thinks so much about how to get this thing to its citizens. Somebody who is in Rutsiro, a school whereby you have to travel uh, 70 kilometers from the main road, that technology is going to take too long for that child who is in that school. But if you think of something else that that child can do swiftly and so easily, then it favors him. The technology comes to enhance what you have already implemented to that child. That's how I'm seeing it. And at the moment, that's what I have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank very you. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, our discussion, our second round of discussion, I'm going to give you a breather because you've answered <laughs> almost half the questions here. So I'll just focus on the gentleman uh, in the panel. I'll also give you a breather <laughs> as well. Now, the second round of discussions focuses on the power of technology to achieve equality. Equality for everyone, everywhere. Now, we're going to tackle this in two ways. We were discussing it earlier. Uh, number one is uh, technology for everyone, everywhere, meaning everyone who is in the city directly accessing technology and everyone outside the city in the rural areas, how they access technology there or uh, internet and all of that. And then we're going to look at it, of course, that's where you'll come in, equality in terms of given opportunities to uh, men and women equally. We have more women than men. We were actually talking about it at the World Expo Development Forum where 51% women and 49% men, meaning uh, so many people were talking about giving equal opportunities to women because 
if the men are less, but the other ones providing money to the women who are more, then it's, it's, it's not proper because the women should be the ones bringing in more of the money. So we'd like to, now we're not gonna talk about money, so let's just <laughs> come to you. Yeah. And um, so now the UN uh, Population Fund has managed to talk to people from the city, outside the city. How has it been getting people to get with the program and uh, establishing certain modules? How has it been for you? Yeah, I, I, I like the way you put the, the question now. It's, it is not only about money. It's not only about million or billion dollar investments. It's also about finding innovative ways of using the existing technology. And of course, the stage of development in uh, Rwanda is not like it is in the United States or in Europe. Uh, but there is an, a lot that can be done in, in Rwanda with the technology that we have on, uh, 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 as it stands now. And I, I would like to give an example of my former job in Madagascar, which also has a similar, well, I'm not a specialist in ICTs, but I think has a similar uh, uh, level of development in, uh, in uh, technology. So in Madagascar, we uh, supported a group of, of young people to set up a page on Facebook uh, where they uh, uh, could uh, uh, have a uh, sort of an information sharing site uh, which could be uh, relatively <coughs> anonymous and where uh, adolescents could find out all kinds of uh, information on uh, on the area of our work, which is reproductive health, sexual health, um, STDs, things that uh, people don't dare to ask always everywhere. And, um, uh, that and, and also about relationships, etc. Uh, uh, so, and I must say, this was a, a rather successful, successful Facebook website. And it doesn't need a lot of technology. You don't even need a laptop to use Facebook. You can nowadays have a rather cheap mobile phones that access uh, uh, that kind of technology. And it really um, enforces uh, young people. It helps them make the right choices in life. And, uh, and uh, it, it has such a potential for growth uh, in, in our societies uh, with regard to uh, any access to information, not only in our area of work, in any other area of work. And, and I think we are just at the start of it. And we don't have to focus too much on very expensive investments. They will come with time, like uh, our colleague from Tigo says. It's something you have to build bottom up. Eh? But uh, in the meantime, don't sit still. Take advantage of what is there and be innovative and creative and find uh, ways to use the technology for the benefit of uh, women, men, and youth of Rwanda. Right, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have another pressing question, of course, to bring back to you about the equality. You see how I'm giving you so much of a breather because when we come to you, it's going to be so intense. Now, uh, we had a question from the gentleman here. We'd like him to at least pose the question before we continue. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Saleh, I'm a web developer. And this question goes to you guys, especially the Tigo guys. So they are close to me. I think they can solve my problem better. So like me as a web developer, at times I'm on the web building something, and I find some service or some software that I would use to better my, my, my process of developing what I develop. And they're telling me that to get this, I need to buy it. Uh, when I check, I click on buying, they are asking me for a credit card or, if not, a <laughs> PayPal account. The, this for a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a web developer, but I'm still in the startup stage. I'm not yet big. I don't have that much money to maybe go apply for a credit card. I, I mean, for, for the, this is all technology. For it to, to be smooth, how is it going to be? most for me to get that product that I've seen online, I've seen on a certain website or on a, from a certain company, and I really need to use in whatever I'm doing. Eh? That, that, that's majorly my question. Uh, 
Locally, I would say uh, it's a very challenging thing so far as far as interconnecting. We, as, as Tigo or I would say telecommunication companies, we all know the phenomenon of mobile money that enables you to, to, to have money from your phone and purchase various things. But one of the biggest challenge right now is to be able to interconnect with the global. Globally, the problem is there is a lot of, um, how would I say, privacy policies and regulation as far as transferring money and interconnecting uh, uh, between two different platforms is concerned. So uh, this is something I believe that uh, telecommunications company are not unaware of, but they're looking at ways to leverage the mobile money that we have right now to be able to integrate globally. Right now, it's possible to integrate on your web. Let's say if you have a development, uh, let's say uh, an e-commerce website that is locally, you can integrate with our platform. Uh, Tigo and allow your customers to pay using mobile money. I'm not sure if anyone has used Hello Food. Anyone has tried it? It's uh, enabled with uh, Tigo Cash, so you are able to do that. So we are trying to build first that um, that culture of paying online. How many times do you pay online? It's really rare. It's something that is rare. But by integrating mobile money, a phone that is accessible with with a feature phone, you can do that transaction, and we allow you to go t on the internet and integrate with that. We build that culture as we are looking on ways to integrate globally, because integrating in a global level, it will surely take time, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. So it's something, a work on progress. But one thing I can add there, m -Pesa already launched in Eastern Europe. It's accepted in England, and really they have uh, uh, light years ahead of many of the other mobile payment and you know why because they're the first uh, mobile payment platform that went like a wildfire so you should look into that because you can uh, kind of use their um, uh, M-Pesa representative here that that you can use and they've already integrated with some of the global uh, platform but one of the thing I would like to emphasize also for you remember 15 years ago PayPal did not exist Young people like you realize that uh, gap within the market. And you know, it was a bunch of programmers. They went and created it. And you know what? eBay bought them for quite a bit of money. So at, at the end of the day, you, the other gentleman, sorry, you did not, I don't remember your name. You're saying about innovation and entrepreneurship. Every gap in the market is an opportunity for you to innovate and go into the market. It is completely insane, I have to say that in Rwanda, you are not able even to pay $1 to get a WhatsApp account. And that's one of the reasons WhatsApp removed even the payment from most uh, third world country, because they had no means to pay even a dollar. Now, I will say part of it is the laziness of the banking system. But the beauty about it, the telecommunication is becoming banking. Where the banking system did not find a solution for the unbanked, the masses, telecommuni telecommunication find the solution. Now you have today, in, um, in Kenya, it's starting where you have uh, um, equity bank, uh, who's now going into kind of the telco and actually applying for a mobile virtual uh, operator, where they will provide a telecom platform for them to provide their service. So what is happening, technology is really uh, enabling. I mean, you are connected. You can find a solution for that problem. Trust me. Innovation, entrepreneurship come from young people who see a problem, anyone who see a problem and find a solution. It doesn't come from the big company. The big company come and buy it. Hotmail, eBay, all those things came from young company. It did not come from established company. It came from young entrepreneur and innovator that saw gap within the market, came up with the solution. And you know what the big guy came? Say, that's what I want. We'll hand you over a lot of money for, for that innovation. And that's the reality of entrepreneurship and innovation. And that is why we need to get access to internet to every possible Rwandan. 
the fastest way possible because that enabled them to play at the global level and you don't know where the, the innovation is going to come. Right, thank you. Uh, now, thank you so much for all your feedback. I would like to pose this to you as well. As you, uh, I can see, is it okay? Cheers, it's okay. We can continue. It's all right. So now I would like to uh, pose this to you and of course the entire panel, but directly to you. We had a certain, uh, it was sort of a game or, or a, a while earlier with some students just like this, where we asked them to write down in just one minute some of the people who they know in the ICT sector here in Rwanda who have had an impact or who they know like at the top of their mind. So we just gave them one minute and they were to write two names that they know. So we collected five papers from all of them and one of them said Akaliza Keza, uh, another one said Clarice Iribajiza and another one said the Minister for Health uh, Binagwaho. Because uh, especially during the Ebola period she was communicating via WhatsApp. So that shows that out of the five, three were women. Meaning, in Rwanda, it is the other way around. Like, most of the people who are recognized for certain, or at least exemplary efforts in ICT and in development and innovation are women. Meaning, there is a problem now in terms of the other way around. How come the women are not being <laughs> highlighted as much? Are we focusing too much on empowering women and leaving the people who we think are okay behind? Uh, just how can this uh, gender uh, appreciation be equalized in terms of innovation? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think we've got some way to go before we have to start worrying about men. men becoming <laughs> over-empowered, I have to say. I mean, look, Ro Rwanda is a, a particularly strong performer in terms of gender equality. I mean, if you look at the... Uh, it's more than 60% of parliament is women now. Um, you don't find that. It's the most female parliament in the entire world. Um, so there's a, there's a tradition here of, of women getting up and taking leadership roles and innovating and, and being practical, yeah. often, you know, as modern history has had it, in adverse circumstances, but rebuilding the country and taking a leading role in that. So I think the culture around female participation in, you know, in all sectors of the economy, but including the modern sectors of the economy, is it, it's, it's already there. Am I worried about men being left behind? No, I'm not particularly <laughs> worried about that because I know, you know, downstairs we have Carnegie Mellon University where, they, <laughs> where they're taking on, you know, bright young students to train them in master's degrees in computer science. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what the, what the data are now, but I know for their first intake there were, th there were three, w three girls out of, I don't know. This time it's one. This time it's one. So. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not yet at that stage where I think we need to, to worry about um, boys being left behind in, in this context. Yeah, but I, mean, I, but I do think it's a, at a broader level, it's a, an important question about making sure that throughout the education process, through kind of elementary and secondary education, that both girls and boys are given equal opportunity to enjoy science and maths and engineering based subjects um, and that they you know both sexes are encouraged to go on and and study them in the future either if they go off in the direction of uh, vocational training or if they go on to university that um, that there is a kind of um, attractiveness for both boys and girls about going into the scientific areas because you know if you look across Africa in general there are very few PhDs in mathematics, in engineering, in some of these kind of real hardcore sciences that will underpin the development of new technologies in, in the future. And it's something that the continent as a whole can get to grips with, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Minister of Health, the Honorable Minister of Health, because yeah, she is a big user of uh, technology to uh, bring uh, messages across on health and uh, and again also uh, going back to the question of uh, access to important information for girls, adolescent girls, uh, you cannot underestimate uh, the internet uh, for that. Another uh, initiative that is now starting in Rwanda is what is called M, M Health, where uh, uh, the Ministry of Health is working on a, a, a uh, 
sort of system of questions and answers that is automated through SMS on mobile phones and that will and that will be for free um, and that will help uh, adolescents and, and youth and particularly girls to find again a lot of answers on burning questions and it doesn't matter where they are again rural urban as long as they get to know that it exists and if they have access to a simple phone that can uh, have uh, text messages, uh, they will be able to uh, get access to information that will help them again grow in life and uh, to, to make the right choices in life with regard to their health uh, that uh, will uh, uh, prevent, uh, for instance, teenage pregnancies, uh, that will help uh, girls continue in school and again, uh, uh, technology there will be a very an important element and I hope it will get off the ground soon in, in Rwanda and that it will be used massively by all adolescents, especially girls, because it will help them uh, find their place in society. And we should not think that in Rwanda uh, gender equality is a, is a, is a given, is a, is a f if given or if mm -hmm. it is finished. There's still a lot of work, especially when you go to rural areas. There's still a lot of work to have more equality for girls, adolescent girls, especially in the rural areas and the villages. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any question to pose to the panelists? Uh, any? All right. Let's look at those two, and then we'll come to you, sir, Mr. John. John? Hello? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think. The, the conversation that is going on is only the most recent of the many, many conversations that we have had, maybe from the year 2000. Uh, but there are a few things that we need to put at a kind of baseline. Uh, and the, this would apply to anybody who is in, a, who is in the public service, including the international public service, because uh, I think we all know that interventions that are not mega interventions are usually not effective. Because if you say that you wish to buy laptops for children, you, you, maybe somebody needs to buy laptops for somebody who is doing a, a master's degree course at the university. Because you could find a situation where you are actually not doing much because the population is very small that you are looking at. And of course, naturally, it's, it's, it's not a human weakness, maybe it's a strength, but if the UNDP gives you 10,000 to develop 100 women, $10,000 to, to for 100 women, that's about $100 each, and if it makes impact, it is very good. But talk about a million, you're talking about millions of people. And the, you should really look at mega interventions, and they are possible. Here we, we had a situation where they multiplied the number of classrooms in one year because the president came up and said, is it nine years? There, there is a kind of terminology for primary school. Basic education. Basic education. Basic education. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm wondering, here we have K-Lab, for example. <laughs> I don't see reasons why we cannot have K-Lab on every tall building that has a sixth floor. <laughs> <laughs> How much is it costing us? It's not costing us much, by the way. I don't think you will convince me that Kerab costs so much mm -hmm. money. <laughs> uh, but, but this is about Agachiro. Because you see, uh, for example, I have uh, a long, uh, I used to work with the UNDP about 30 years ago, 1983. The UNDP hasn't changed much from that time. Because the UNDP is an international organization that has to move, to move on certain rules that may have very little to do with the development, although they are doing development. Mm -hmm. Now, we used to have a situation where they would come up and say, a government is hiring so many people, and the country, in order to, to move with the proper economic policies, they should reduce staff, all right? But you see, this would apply to where you are hiring small people. Not where, for example, a national is hiring two or three ministers per ministry. 
So you would have a situation where actually you've got no staff except directors. And the simple, simple job. We know what comes from very, very simple things. If you read uh, Steve Jobs' uh, background, his was being able to exploit a bit in the graphics. You don't, you, you need to, de to develop, we don't need doctorates, master's degrees. Rwanda is, of course, doing it under the UDA. But we need to do more. Indira Agu, you come from Kenya. Tourism in Kenya grew. You know, the economists will tell you it will take 10, it will be 10% growth per annum. Tourism in Kenya after independence grew by maybe 50% per annum. Why? Because they introduced a small fee per tourist who came in. And they said, okay, fine. As long as somebody comes in to employ, to employ Kenyans, he will be welcome to come and invest. At that time, only a Kenya would understand it because it was not yet a policy that investment, that people have to compete for investment. All right? So I just want to ask us ourselves who are in public policy, because me, I'm retired now, <laughs> that we should really look at anything that is not a mega, a mega implementation. Maybe we shouldn't think about it. Maybe we shouldn't, because it's really to, to tell me you are going to, to support 50 women who are crossing the border. What impact? What impact? Would, maybe you could use it as a pilot project, of course, to teach you something. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I, you. That I, was I a very, too long. Yes, very, it's very, strong. very. Uh, all right. Uh, so we have the question. Before we'll move over to you, but we have one question that we need to answer. This question. So uh, Joseph, you'd like to touch on that? Yeah. I, very briefly, I think that information communication technology are the way to go to get to a big audience and to scale up uh, initiatives. If you do something in a small lab somewhere with 100 women, okay, it's small. But if you can find innovative ways, and it's you young people who work in ICTs who have to find these ways, you have to be creative. You have to set up, it's not always eBay. It can also be a, a project that can get funding from UNDP. I cannot promise anything. I'm not from UNDP, <laughs> but that can get funding from UNDP and that helps to scale up ac exactly using these ICTs that have this potential of uh, getting to a big public. Uh, uh, he mentioned k -Lab, so I must uh, <laughs> go there. So I'm also the chairman of k -Lab. Now, one of the things, and I will totally, will not want to have UNDP putting a million or a hundred million into an initiative like k -Lab. And let me tell you why. This initiative, it is the community that started it. Young entrepreneur in ICT, other developer, they came together with RDB, with the ministry, and I say, we need to have a place for young people who just have an idea to come together, work together, an enabling environment. So they did it on their own. And that's why today is still successful. I don't have to mention it, but there's many such initiatives that was initiated by those donors. Money was pouring, consultant came, nice big uh, study, all blah, 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 blah. You just do a check, they either close or not working. This is working because it's a grassroots initiative. Of course we engage the donor, but we engage the donor by leading not on the other way around. And I think part of what is Rwanda is doing, part of Agachiro, part of what has enabled Rwanda in 20 years to really do a transformation that is unprecedented. It is the fact that it's the second point that our president say, we, we hold ourselves accountable. It is us who need to tell them where they need to intervene not to the other end. And we need to understand where the donor intervention actually make a difference and where it does not. Because remember, in the last 50 years, there's a hundred of billion that's been put into development. And even now, they recognize where it works and where it doesn't work. So, but first of all, without us taking the lead and the accountability, there's no initiative that is sustainable and it's gonna work in the long term. So. All right. uh, thank you for that. Yeah. I'd like to add something to you because something that uh, will touch directly on what you're talking about. But we have about 10 minutes to get on the Skype call with New York and we have one question for you and one question from the uh, guy in the audience and one here. But let me touch on something that you've mentioned, uh, grassroots level, and you've 
you two have talked about it. Now, because I'm involved in the news, we had to go cover a story about uh, Samsung Smart School. I don't know whether you've heard about it, but we went so far into Pujasera, a place where uh, when the car passes, people have to come out of their houses because they've not seen cars pass there for months, weeks. They've not seen a car pass there. Now, we went all the way deep and we found a small classroom that is basically almost a quarter of this whole place. A quarter, and they had a huge TV screen, huge, almost 80 inches, and uh, laptops, about uh, 30 of them, that was supplied by Samsung. Now, you see, that is not such a huge initiative. It's just something really small, and they don't talk much about it. It's probably just highlighted by uh, journalists who go to visit the area who are very few. There are about 10 who've covered the thing so far, and it's been on for almost two years. Now, what the teachers were telling us is that of all the classes that they have there, uh, the, the student, most of the students who study in that class are students who have to pick water for, for their household. But they, now what the te teachers were telling us were that these students normally rush. They can miss all the maths classes, the physics, chemistry. They can miss those classes mm -hmm. in the morning. But they go home, they pick the water, they go to the river, they pick the water, they rush home, dress up, and run to the classroom so that they don't miss that ICT class. You see, and they are really attentive. You can find an ICT class is full of students who are not even on the same standard, uh, standard one, standard two. They're not in there, but they love that class so much and they get all the physics, all the chemistry direct from that one class. So it's, it's not a huge initiative and it's being done. I'm sure there are so many more that are not being talked about, but I'm sure there are some, and I really appreciate uh, your, your question, but I'm sure there are some initiatives that are being done in Rwanda that are not being spoken about. I think we just need to make sure that there are more and it's over to you, the key players who are going to make that happen. So we have uh, your question. Thank you. I'm Livingston too. I'm a fresh graduate from Nash the former National University of Rwanda. I wanted, actually in this morning, I was reading on the Daily Mail. I came to read something interesting about a gun which it takes and receives mobile messages. In case a driver is using a mobile phone, it sends a signal to a gun to a policeman, which helps in that reducing the accidents on the road. This might, m not, this might not be relevant, but I'm talking about the U UNDP and World Bank. Rwanda is one of the d developing countries which has less capacity to extend that technology that we need to, to, to have a future of the planet we, ha we want. UNDP, in partnership with World Bank, I just wanted to maybe like highlight what they are just trying to help developing countries which have less resources in the, in the extension of that technology which can give the platform to innovation in, in creating a better world. My second question, we talk about gender equality. Yes, we mentioned the Kalis and Kiralis, but the biggest population of the, Rwandi, the, Rwandi, of the Rwandis are women. But how many do, do computer science compared to men? You find a class of computer science, more than 65% or 70% are, are males. Again, we have a population which, is, which has the biggest percentage of women. I was thinking maybe like companies like Tigo or the ICT, Chamber, PSF, what platform can they put? My, can I quote? May, maybe not a favor to encourage more girls. We have girls which are progressing in, uh, in technology, but again, the numbers are not matching the, what the population is saying to us. Meaning we have people who are active, but again, depending on the population we are having, they're still not convincing. Like, maybe I, I talked about you depending on the challenge they always have, developing like any idea which can help in ICT solutions, you know, stuff like that. But again, the applicants, people who apply, the biggest number I doubt, I don't doubt is they are ma males. I just wanted to have your ideas. I thank you. Who would like to take that bullet? <laughs> 
I wouldn't have much uh, I wouldn't have much to to give to him because in the UNDP I I personally I I don't have much to get from there that I could that I could do present to him because most of his uh, most of his views were towards the UNDP or maybe if there's anybody from the UNDP who could assist in getting <laughs> that. I can get the question about women uh, this is the thing as much as we are in a market where women are not there's not enough role models and for you to be able to to promote women you need the role models. That's where we were talking about um, Akaliza, that's where they were coming on top of mind because the whole point of that is to, to show uh, to the rest of ladies that it's possible, it's doable, there are others doing it. But uh, saying that there is a particular platform that the company that I'm representing here could build, um, I wouldn't sign up on that. <laughs> because there is beyond, we serve the whole country, but um, there are initiatives around uh, the country where uh, the girls in ICT are working hard to provide enough awareness, but again, it goes with the nature of women. We, um, as much as we want to be, we have e equality of opportunity available to us, but the nature of us as being women we tend to give up soon. And that's why there is a lot of awareness to be uh, promote, to promote women because the, the way God made us is we usually want to balance the life, uh, family lifestyle and the work. So usually you wouldn't find enough engineers and who would want to stay on the job at night to fix uh, a problem, a downtime problem. Uh, and a man, it wouldn't be a problem. The reason why I'm giving that example is my first job, I was a data engineer at Rondetel, and at that point in time, I used to have my friend telling me, are you really gonna get married? <laughs> so that's just the way the market is and the culture is, and I think in uh, pl places like Kelab, and other open spaces where we talk about technology, there should be more of awareness. And what I could say is to have, that Tigo can do, possibly, is to prom to showcase those ladies who are in the engineering field and they are able to make it while balancing their lifestyle and what uh, and, the, uh, and the work that they are doing. That it's possible, actually. So that would be my take on your mm -hmm. question. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's, uh, he's settled now. Uh, we'd like to come to you, John. As the mic goes to uh, the gentleman on my right, uh, we'd like to go, go to you, John. You're currently on a tour of Rwanda to promote TVET's, uh, these vocational schools. Yes. Yes, uh, so please tell us, how has it been? Uh, do you find it, do you think it is relevant for people who are outside the city to understand what is happening in the city? Do you think, according to you, uh, should people start uh, so, uh, at least getting to know more about uh, the innovation and more of typing than manual work. What, do, what, is your, uh, thought, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, thank you so much. Um, TVET itself, that one, it's a technical vocational educational training. It's a system to get you out of poverty. Whether you know ICT or you don't know, Tivet, it's just telling you, go to where you can have your vocational training. And that is in VTC, Vocational Training Centers. Uh, the government of Rwanda at the moment, as I said before, our Rwandan government thinks for the citizens. Somebody who is in a Deep down in Bubaza, deep down in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the West, cannot easily think or cannot easily uh, give himself time to think that my hands can get me out of poverty. Now, what the TV, the, the TV does 
is to go in schools. And in schools, there is ICT in schools. But now, I'll go back to the other thing that I said. It takes long for those children to benefit from the technology at the moment. Mostly we are in third world countries, whereby we get the fruits very late. But that child is not going to sit and wait. There is another way you can use without even uh, employing our, uh, anybody from ICT. Now, if you tell this boy to go for TVET, he's going to learn something that will give him money quicker than the other one who went into the university and then came out of the university, started running up and down with the <laughs> dossiers looking for <laughs> job. You understand? Now, him, after senior three, after the basic nine, uh, this uh, the, the primary basic nine, the nine basic education, rather, he can easily go and apply to the TV, to, to the VTC school. There are VTC centers being built up now by the, by the Swiss contact. Uh, Swiss, the, the Switzerland government with the Swiss contact, they are having that initiative of getting all these centers built all over the country. So that if you fail to go to the university, don't sing, don't sit down and just put your hands in your head and say, okay, what am I for? What am I going to do? No. Go to the VTC. They are going to teach you how to tailor. They are going to teach you uh, everything about, f about cooking. You are going to learn about, uh, uh, about lumbering, about carpentry, all that sort. So from there, you are not only going to sit with your knowledge, but the government is going to help you as long as you put yourselves into the cooperative. The government is going to give you a capital. And that capital, you are only going to use your brains to form up work for yourself. Now, that one is just going to ease the life for these people. Where ICT is not there yet, people can go to vocational training centers. And technology is not, uh, it's not all about ICT alone. If somebody, if somebody from, um, from Biumba and has got two cows, and those two cows eat every day, so every day they must, they must produce some waste. You'll have the cow dung. If this person is taught how to use, to, to, to make use of the cow dung, that he gets gas out of it, that's another technology. And this person is going even to think of making gas cylinders, or maybe from trees, from somewhere else. And he's going to sell, and he gets money. So, uh, to me, it, it's all about, it's all about, uh, Innovating these people, giving them something to do, and let their life be easy. Maybe if the machines are not there, if the laptop is not there, a child in Irutsiro is maybe not have a chance to get laptops because it's kind of expensive in third world countries. But at least something else, another technology will come to drive him to get something whereby at least he can. Can get that. Thank you very much, John. Uh, that was John giving us a more hands-on approach to ensuring progress. So we really appreciate that. We're getting both sides of the coin here at the Social Good Summit. Now, uh, our time is almost uh, running out, so we'd like to, we wouldn't want to leave anyone out. There's a gentleman here who had a question uh, here in the white T-shirt. Thank you. My name is Richard Mlajishimana. Uh, I would like to ask to Tigo the presenter <laughs> uh, So now, suppose someone has an idea whether a girl boy, I don't know. But he has a good idea to present to you. So now uh, I want to talk about in terms of businesses, and how can an entrepreneur comes to Tigo and present the idea so that how do you copy, or how do you work with this entrepreneur, what the step, what the procedures to follow so that someone who has an idea, want to integrate with the Tigo, who want to work with the Tigo, what is the stage, what is the process that can be used? 
The second question is, uh, you said that you have an, an API of, you know, of how to pay online with Tigo. So now, I'd like to know how to access this API and how to use it as a developer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think this sounds more as a personal question, but I will first, uh, we can talk about it later, but um, I would first respond in terms of having an idea and wanting to talk to us. It all depends on which level that your idea is. And the other thing is beyond talking to us directly, Tigo has placed, as I mentioned before, an incubation center where you can, you your product might not be yet uh, ready for initial market introduction, but it's so uh, potentially viable that we are willing to invest in it. So um, we have that incubation center where we have intakes every six months. We had taken the first, uh, the first batch is going to be announced very soon. So all I want to say is, uh, it's all really depend. It's really good. We have a lot of good ideas on the market, but ideas we need to be processed to a certain level for it to be viable and uh, relevant to the market. We can be open to listen to your ideas as far as you, as the owner of idea, feel confident enough that it's ready for the market. So uh, as far as the API is concerned, um, we can talk about it later, depending on what you're doing on the market, and see how we can work together if that's possible. Perfect. There's a question right behind you. Do you, do you have a, a follow-up question to that? Yeah. So, but you said after six months, it's, it, it takes longer than just to to reach you. Now, if there is a short way, how uh, people can maybe. You know, I, I cannot wait uh, six months to just for Tigo to come. So now, I, I want to know if I have a project is already uh, tested, it's, it's working well. Now, what what can be a shortcut without waiting those six months? <laughs> uh, that's all that I was saying, talking about. It's all about assessing and see how comfortable you are with your product and how comfortable we feel it's relevant to the market. It's uh, At the end of the day, it's a mutual, uh, co um, mutual conversation between you as an entrepreneur and what you want to do with your product and how you think Tigo can be relevant to you or even any other. It's just like looking for any other partner. So we are really open for various discussions. Maybe I can just uh, uh, throw your question have you had instances, because I've seen this happen over and over again, where an entrepreneur comes up with an idea and they know that this is foolproof, it's going to work, they want to come to the uh, investment facility or someone who has the money and they say, I want money now, I don't have a business plan, but I know, I know this will work. Have you had instances like that? Well, they don't come to us because we only <laughs> give our money to governments, but, um, but it's certainly the case that one of the issues with entrepreneurs here in Rwanda, as in many countries, is that there's a sort of basic, basic skill set that goes along with being an entrepreneur, and it does involve the ability you know, to plan and to do your financial books correctly and to do your business plans. And, and that doesn't, often that doesn't fit very easily with people who live in the realms of really good ideas and exciting innovations. It's a bit boring to get down and sort of do all your books and do all the kind of planning. But it's a fundamental skill that any banker is going to want to see if you're going to go and ask them for a loan. So, I mean, there are organizations around town that actually train in those basic on the basic skills of being an entrepreneur, not the kind of, not, not the exciting ones of getting the ideas and developing the product, but the kind of bread and butter foundational skills of being able to manage a company and do your tax return and all of the other things that people don't really like doing, but, but, but it's important. If you're going to set up a company, you need to have those skills as well. Right. I hope your question is answered now. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we have one final question from the gentleman here at the front. Yes, uh, my name is Maxim. I'm currently working on an app that does, um, it sa works with saving groups, Ikimina, and um, also does... Uh, 
He also does uh, personal saving and, and budgeting. Um, I've reached at the stage of product, um, testing. In two days it will come out for testing. Um, but my question goes to Patrick and uh, Arsh, probably you too. They, there's still an issue with the, the um, computer illiteracy. Uh, I don't know what we base on ourselves when we talk about ICT being in Rwanda, because in the village, the number is big in the city, but outside the city, it's really low. So my app, if I'm working on that app, probably those people are the ones who are in Kiminas, most of those seven groups. How do I reach to them? Because the platform I'm working on is Android at the beginning, but it's hard to get those people and the they are computer illiterate. You, you, you can't deny that fact that is there. Um, the other part is goes to the Tigo guys again for the API. So it will be connected with the APIs, Tigo and the banks. So I don't know how easy you guys will make it for for entrepreneurs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say we are. Our API is open. I think as far as mobile money, um, uh, fi mobile oriented payment is, our uh, API is open. And as I said, again, it's all about discussing on the viability and of what you're doing and how relevant that is for our organization, for us to be able to talk. And the other thing to, the comment about your first uh, um, concern about your product, um, that's one of the concerns that I have most of the time that I meet uh, entrepreneurs. It's all about targeting your market and knowing what is who you, are, you want to serve, for how long you want to serve them, and when you think that would be relevant for the rest. Of course, telco companies are doing various efforts to, to get the rural uh, uh, area with the smartphone because most of the flexibility, uh, the solution that provides flexibility and efficiency of service comes on uh, on the version of apps. But if it's possible, we had, I think, uh, two months ago, if I'm not mistaken, we had a training here with a company called Vasco De and friends where their slogan is connecting the unconnected. So they provide a platform where you can adapt your idea or your product on a USSD platform. So if you think that would be your solution is more relevant to the unconnected, as they call them, or not yet on the smartphone, that's something you would want to look into. But other than that, if you develop an app, it's a reality, it's a fact, the penetration is only less than 2% in terms of smartphone in the whole country. So you just need to deal with that fact and hoping that various initiatives as far as uh, Shabuka smartphone or Smarty phone from uh, the other competitor that I won't uh, mention <laughs> uh, are able to reach to uh, our population and that base of smartphone increases. Other than that, there's nothing more. It's mm -hmm. more of you really understanding your target market and how you will make money. There was a question that was posed yeah. to yeah, oh, yes, yes. Um, okay. Patrick and the, the mm -hmm. Afri okay. is it African Bank or World Bank? Yeah. No, no, Probably. she's World Bank. I'm World Bank. Uh, He's here. Uh, World population. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm mm -hmm. adding a little bit on that because the app is not uh, Rwanda based only. I realize in Africa there's all over the, the continent there's seven groups, so it will go, it's going to be working all across Africa, and my my problem is still also to know the penetration of the smartphone. I've done my research, and the the business plan is done also. Um, we are almost launching the app, so it's but still the the tricky part is how will we get back from it to since we have a small number of users, right? Our target is smartphone people who are earning money, who use money every day, and the emphasis is on 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 personal budgeting and finance, mm -hmm. savings, how you manage your saving, how you manage expense. So it's it's more of the educated people I'm looking at, 
but still there are people who doesn't have smartphone outside Kigali and and for the African bank and uh, World Bank how will you bring help to that initiative mm -hmm. I, mean, I think you know if I can just respond to that I mean for, for any entrepreneur actually Rwanda itself is a small market any entrepreneur any any anybody who's going to be investing in 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 Rwanda is generally thinking of a beyond Rwanda market. Um, and I would urge you to do the same. The middle class in Africa, on the African continent, is actually pretty big. It may be rather small in Rwanda today, but across the continent, it's, it's, it's pretty big. So um, I would urge you, just like other, like other businesses are doing that are investing in Rwanda, to think regionally, think about the Great Lakes region, think about the East Africa region, think about the whole of Africa, think about Southern Africa. Um, and that's the way you'll get your critical mass. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the trends of people who come in and invest in Rwanda, I mean, I'm not looking just specifically the ICT market, but any market, they come and set up a business here. They're not just thinking about serving the Rwanda market. They're thinking about Eastern DRC. They're thinking about Burundi. They're thinking about uh, uh, Southern Uganda. So, you know, it's going to be all about regional integration, about getting your idea out beyond the boundaries of, of Rwanda until, you know, even, even if everybody in Rwanda gets a smartphone, it's still a relatively small number relative to the whole African continent. Your, your questions are answered. Your yeah, thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, we're still waiting for, we have at least three minutes before we join in with New York. I don't know whether that's going to be possible right now, but uh, for all of us who are following uh, through the live link, I don't know which camera to look at, uh, the hashtag is 2030 now, so you can follow in on the uh, Social Good Summit happening in Rwanda and happening all over the world. So 2030 now, that is the hashtag for the Social Good Summit. So maybe we can have one final word from e each and every one of you, because after this we won't be able to come back to you. And then, of course, Mr. Joseph, you can tell us about this initiative, what this means mm -hmm. uh, for us here in Rwanda. Show your selfie. Right. So over to you, um, Mr. John. <laughs> any final comments and remarks on uh, regarding this topic? Thank you once again, George. Um, but what I would have to say last would be like, I really appreciate the organizers for who have hosted us tonight. And uh, ICT in Rwanda here, it's a very great thought. By the year 2030, I think the entire nation of Rwanda, small as it is, at least will have gone to something like 90 percent, or maybe to have favors from the from the ICT. And uh, what I would like to say is that at the moment, at the moment, we need to think much and to do much, not only for the city dwellers, but we have got a very great population out of the city that needs to have jobs. We need to have, they need to create jobs. So if the technology would go, would go beyond of thinking uh, the hard drives, and then we take the technology to another level, whereby even the other one who cannot set foot in the city, at least has got something that can make his life more easier. That means by thinking much of how to utilize what he has at hand. We are surrounded by, we are surrounded by nature. Nature itself, nature itself, we can use our brains just to get technology, use, uh, use our minds to have technology, getting everything that we need out of our nature here. I think, to me, we would love to be broad, even further. Mr. Patrick, sir, I think we need, we, we need to think much and much even for those people who can mm -hmm. not set foot here. Thank, Thank you. you very much, John. Over to you, Andrew. I think you've had the most to talk about today. 
<laughs> okay, uh, I really like the topic as it is, uh, 2030 now. Uh, all I can say is it's really starting now by the type of product that our entrepreneur will develop and how they will um, customize it to the needs of the people on the market. So there is a fair balance that there needs to be applied on the market, which is not to be limited by the lack of current access to certain technology to be innovative and at the same time to find that level of saying, uh, let me be innovative and adapt this to my people and have it evolve. So um, I'm just eager to see what 2030 mm -hmm. will be like. Yeah, le, I, I mean, uh, if you kind of think at a big picture level and what the economy of Rwanda has to, how it has to transform in order to be where Rwanda wants to be in 2030, um, what will have to happen to maintain growth rates of 8, 9, 10% per annum? Um, the agriculture sector will have to decline in, in importance. People will have to come off the land. People will have to get jobs that are outside, outside agriculture. And, and it is that process so far that has, that has driven poverty reduction and it has driven the reduction in inequality that we've seen in, in Rwanda so far. Um, and as people do that, as people stop being farmers on their own land and start moving into kind of non-farming occupations, I think the ICT sector is going to be a very important driver of people's livelihoods. So. Um, yeah, I'll just sort of leave it there. But I think it's got a very important part in, in achieving the objectives that Rwanda seeks to achieve over the next 20 year, 25 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Patrick? Yeah. Uh, here, I'm going to try to go back uh, from uh, 1994 and even beyond uh, be before that. Now, what young innovator and entrepreneur need to understand? The path is rocky, is hard. No one will hand you anything. The bank will say no. The telco will say no. Everybody will say no. The one that will succeed is the one who will figure out how to go beyond those hump. And you know what? We have a great example. What is Rwanda of today? There were young people who decided, they were told that they're not allowed to come back to their country. Well, they came back, didn't they? They also told you know, back then that this country will amount to nothing. Guess what they did? Exactly. So remember what our president uh, said at the 20th uh, remembrance of the genocide. The three principles that underpin the post-war reconstruction of Rwanda. The first one, we chose to stay together. You know, and we, we brought innovation. And it is entrepreneurship. We find solution to our own problem. How we deal with the hundreds of thousands of genocide perpetrators, that is an innovation. We could not handle it with Western style uh, justice system. Now, second, they say we're gonna be accountable for our future. Now, as an entrepreneur, you're accountable for your future. No one's gonna hand you anything. So stop asking because no one's gonna give you anything. If they're not giving you, go take it. I mean, this is the word, this is the reality. Rwanda was not developed with people that asked. They went and took. When we face a problem, our leadership went and solved it. They did not wait for somebody to solve it for them. And the third thing he say, dream big. And we dream big. So now it's your turn to dream big. These, the people who handed out this country, it is the greatest generation of Rwanda. We are here asking what this, this, this can do for us. They haven't asked anyone. They went and did it. So now you have a safe country. You have a connected country. You have uh, 10 times more university that, that were there. I mean, how long are you going to continue to ask? How, it is time that we give. It is time that we roll our hand and say, we're going to go and make it happen, period. No question, no uh, no reason, and that is what will lead us to the 2030, and that's the only thing. So now, think what you're going to do. All the problems you are facing have a solution. You will find the solution. Nobody else will find it for you. 
And that is the underpinning of Agachiro, and this is the underpinning of modern post-war reconstruction of Rwanda. We will be the greatest nation because we took ownership of our future, period. That's it. <laughs> Pardon, Patrick for EAC President 2030. Sorry, no. <laughs> Uh, now we have the final word from you, Joseph, and then uh, now as you finish, please tell us what this, this means. Show yourself. As you give your final remarks, what does yeah. this mean? Yeah, it's also related to 2030, <laughs> actually. So yeah, it's a, the, the Show Your Selfie campaign is an initiative by UNFPA in the form of a visual petition. So it's a platform to bring young people together to amplify and to empower them to be seen and have their voices heard. Uh, so the concept is very simple. Eh? One selfie is like a personal signature uh, to show that one believes in the power of uh, 1.8 billion uh, young people on this planet right now. And so the thousands and thousands of photographs that will be uh, uh, coming in from all corners of the globe, they are aimed to send a clear message to the leaders that it's time to put young people in the limelight, eh, in the spotlight. Uh, now this message will be delivered to world leaders and decision makers over the next year. And the visual pet petition will be delivered to them in September uh, 2015 during the General Assembly, uh, calling on all governments to invest in specific policies addressing rights and needs of young people. And, uh, so the visual petition will ask for youth needs to be included across every new 2030 development goal. Huh? This means calling for inclusion in the post-2015 development agenda of education, employment skills and opportunities, quality health care, including access to contraception, comprehensive sexuality education, protection from violence and harmful practices, and participation in decision-making. So how to participate? It's very simple. You take your selfie, you send it through your Twitter account to the hashtag, it says there, show, show your selfie. Hashtag show your selfie on Twitter. There's also a dedicated website where you can upload if you don't have a, a Twitter account. Show your selfie. Thank you very much for the youth of uh, planet 2030 thank you very much and there is a stand there at the entrance if you need any more uh, information about show yourself there is a stand there at the entrance so at this Take point <laughs> are you giving phones as well <laughs> <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> I would love to. You have to be young. But I have you only have one. <laughs> you have to be young to do it. We can't do it. <laughs> what is the age limit? What is the what age, the age limit? limit? We, we would think if you would invite a few young people to stand together with you, that would be great. <laughs> and then you show your support as well as yeah. World Bank uh, country manager together with the youth of Rwanda. We should have touched on that when we were talking about equality for all generations. <laughs> but th thank you very much uh, for all your contribution. Now, uh, thank you very much to John Kennedy, actor and stage director, one of the most brilliant narrators I've ever seen. I'll always say that. Uh, Angel Visamaza, new product development manager at Tigo, Caroline Turk, uh, World Bank Rwanda, uh, Mr. Patrick uh, Kabajema. Yes, uh, the chairman of the ICT chamber and Joseph Marion, uh, UNFPA representative. Thank you very much for all your mm -hmm. contribution. Thank you to all of you who've, been, who've managed to stay with us uh, despite starting late and uh, staying with us through the entire two hours. All the people who asked questions. Of course, thank you to the UNDP for making sure that this event went well. Uh, Lucas and the team for giving us the technical support. Uh, for all of you who participated online and all of you who followed through with the hashtag. Please make sure that you get their contacts after this. I'm sure they will not run, run out immediately, especially Tigo, <laughs> because we all have very many questions for her. Uh, my name is George Ndirango. Thank you very much for uh, taking your time to be here with us at the Social Good Summit 2030 now. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, George. I hope you brought enough business cards. <laughs>